In September last year, Armenia and Azerbaijan went to war. In 44 days of fighting, the fortunes of the two countries and their people were turned upside down. What did you manage to take with you when you left? Wash me bun. Wash me bun. The BBC has been given rare access to both countries. We find old hatred stirred up. Bizden bizim kimi herbitlerden zavanlardan heyfe çıkabilmiyipler korkularından ancak böyle taşlara ancak böyle taşlara cüzdüzatır. Zansız taşlara. And what looks like new crimes being committed? Looks to me like it could have been where that church was. I hope you find your brother. So who really won this war? The Russian military have a checkpoint just down there. They call the shots round here now. And what does the future hold for people who've lived through and lost so much? Naila and Rasim are Azerbaijani, and they're on their way home to Karabakh. It's 28 years since the couple fled Armenia's invasion with their baby, Ali. For the first time, they're heading back. Ali's a dad now. Naila Rasim and Ali's journey, fleeing, then returning, is the story of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Two neighbours, two wars, the bitterest of enemies. Nagorno-Karabakh is an Armenian majority area inside Azerbaijan's international borders. In 1992, a long-running dispute over who should control it turned into war. Armenia invaded, taking over Nagorno-Karabakh and the surrounding areas. 30,000 people died, and a million, the vast majority of them Azerbaijanis like Rasim and Naila, were forced from their homes. Rasim was at a wedding when the Armenian assault began. <laughs> For more than two decades, Rasim, Naila and Ali, along with his wife and child, have lived as refugees in a cramped apartment hundreds of kilometers away. Arz edirəm ki, yenə qaydaq. Yenə o torpağımıza gedək. Yenə orada həmin o günlərimizi yaşayaq. Nə ömrümüz varsa yenə gedək orada yaşayaq. Last September, everything changed. The second Karabakh war broke out with Azerbaijan launching an attack on Armenian positions. With the backing of Turkey and its high-tech drones, the Azerbaijanis made rapid progress. In 44 days of war, Armenia lost large parts of the land it had seized in the 1990s and had to give up even more as part of a Russian-brokered ceasefire agreement. Moscow immediately deployed nearly 2,000 peacekeepers into what's left of the Armenian enclave. Rasim and Naila's village was one of the first that Azerbaijan recaptured, opening up the possibility of the return they've long dreamed of. 
We helped arrange their permits and transport to go back. But at the cemetery, there's a problem. It's been vandalized. Graves have been dug up and looted. <laughs> Rasim has to search for the pieces of his father's headstone. <laughs> Recep, kurban oğlu, oğlu sözü yoktu, ölüm tarihi var. Bizden, bizim kimi hərbiçilerden, zamanlardan heyfi çıxa bilmiyiblər, korkularından ancaq belə daşlara, ancaq belə daşlara gücü çatır, cansız daşlara. Our movements inside Azerbaijan have to be approved by the authorities and we are always accompanied. We drive for hours through the ruins of Azerbaijani villages that the Armenians looted and destroyed in the early 1990s. Getting to the Armenian settlements that Azerbaijan drove people out of last year is more difficult. We're blocked from going to the two largest towns and are eventually taken to a village that Armenians call Mets Tagher. As we approach, we're told the army won't let us in because of landmines. So, do you think the army are telling you the truth when they say it's mines, or they just don't want us to go there? Well, what's the reason for us not to go there? Or maybe I don't know. There have been videos around of the army doing bad stuff to Armenian places. I don't know. Maybe that's why. Uh, I haven't seen those videos, but anyway, we'll see. The videos, which were posted to social media, show Azerbaijani soldiers killing and mutilating Armenians. In the end, they do let us into the village. Well, after a lot of pushing, a lot of phone calls, this is the first time we've got into a village that actually meaningfully changed hands in the recent conflict six months ago. There were Armenians living here in these houses. Now, Azerbaijan is very much in control of it. So this graffiti is graffiti done by the Azeri soldiers as they capture this village. They've either put their names up there or the names of the places where they come from. Arminder tells us his family were forced out of Karabakh in the first war. What happened to your family has now happened to lots of ethnic Armenian families. You, Not you, lots you, of must, you must understand how they feel now. Do you know the, uh, the number of population around? I'm sure that it's not more than a thousand. Do you know the number of refugees from Azerbaijan? Million. They came here 30 years ago. If you move to some place that does not belong to you, you have to know that some the, there will come a time when you will move out there. The next day, our minder is nowhere to be seen. With just the local police for company, we go to Jibreel. It's yet another Azerbaijani town that the Armenians looted and destroyed in the 1990s. We've come here because we've seen this video on social media. It shows a man celebrating on the roof of Jebrail's Armenian church after the area was captured by Azerbaijan last year. We don't mention the video but tell the police we'd like to see the church and they take us here. It's clearly not the right place. Just a little bit further on. There. Yes, sir, maybe like a... Who is the Yeah, so I'm going to turn right and then... Okay, let's, let's stop. What does the map say? Well, the map says it should be on the top of here. Seems rather unlikely.
Okay, so, looks to me like it could have been where that church was. Okay, look here, it was definitely here. Okay, so we can see from the, the trees here, they're a very de definite shape. You can see them over there, they match. So we can say with some conviction that on this area here was an Armenian church. We know it was still standing here when the Azeris came in because they posted videos of it. And now it has been destroyed. What happened to the church? During the war it was destroyed. It can't have been destroyed during the, during the war because there are videos of the Azeris here. No, it wouldn't happen. They destroyed it themselves. Azerbaijan has promised to protect religious sites, so we took our findings to the authorities in Baku. So what has happened to that church, that chapel now? It is just standing in Jabra, the region of Azerbaijan. Okay. Can, I, can I show you something from, from mm -hmm. when we went there? Mm -hmm. So, this was the, the church when mm -hmm. they, they opened it mm -hmm. uh, in 2017. And then we went back there yesterday. You can see it's been totally destroyed. Uh, because it's a proper geolocation, I don't know. It needs to be checked uh, once again, double you checked can, on the you ground. You can see here the tree mm -hmm. here, the tree here. And this is the site which we were given for where mm -hmm. the church, the chapel was. Mm -hmm. it's, been it's been destroyed. In Jabrail, never ever Armenians lived. If, and if, building any religious site or changing religious, cultural character of the region is in a violation of international humanitarian law. And you have seen the level of destruction in Jabrail, Fizuli. More than eight cities of Azerbaijan have been destroyed. It's like a Hiroshima. In other words, he's saying whatever's happened in recent months, it's nothing compared to what Armenians did to Azerbaijani villages in Karabakh in the 1990s. It's a point I put to Armenia's foreign minister. Perhaps you'd like to apologize for what, what Armenia did in those occupied territories. During the war, there were, you know, uh, wrongdoings on every side. If there was any case, it was, let's say, individual approach. It was not a state policy about that. Well, having and been there, can I just say, it looks very systematic. The same happens now in the territories fall under control of Azerbaijan, particularly in the villages and cities of Hadrut region of Nagorno-Karabakh. The final stop in Karabakh for Naila and Rasim is the ruins of where they once lived. As they prepare to leave, Ali is on the phone to his daughter. Damış, babanın babanın evine gelmiş. Babanın evine gelmiş. Ne geçeydi? Ha. Gelmek istiyorsan bura. Hmm, burada çoklu mimiler var. Mimiler var burada geçe, koyunlar var, kuzular var. Bura cennet. In Armenia, the loss of Karabakh is still sinking in. The Lalayen family were forced to flee during the war last year. They're looking at our footage as they're from the same village 
Metz Tagher that we went to with our Azerbaijani minder. Home for the Lalayens is now a cramped hostel on the outskirts of Armenia's capital, Yerevan. Memories are still fresh of the day they fled. What did you manage to take with you when you left? Three of the Lalayen brothers fought in the war, and we sit with two of them, Karen and Georgi. They're still coming to terms with defeat and the loss of territory. This is your brother? Uh -huh. The men's oldest brother is missing. What's his name? Eric. The family were told he'd been killed, but his body still hasn't been found. Then, a few weeks ago, a niece thought she recognized him in a video posted to TikTok by Azerbaijani soldiers. And you're sure that this is Eric, this is your brother? <laughs> Armenia says more than 150 prisoners of war are still being held by Azerbaijan. But no one has any specific information about Eric. We leave Yerevan and head southeast towards the mountains of Nagorno-Karabakh. Defeat and the army's withdrawal has brought a crisis of national confidence. Armenia was once this region's security guarantor. Now Russia has taken on that role. So this road is the only link between Armenia, the outside world, and what's left of the ethnic Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's just over there, those hills there. Now, since the war, the Armenians have not had control over who and what uses this road. That's down to the Russians. The Russian military have a checkpoint just down there. They decide, they call the shots round here now. We're denied permission to enter and are told privately that the Russians are blocking almost all foreigners. It's a real pain that we have to talk like this rather than in person, Mr. Baglarian. <laughs> that evening, we speak to a Nagorno-Karabakh official on a WhatsApp call. Has Nagorno-Karabakh become another one of these little states that we see in this part of the world which are occupied by Russia? No, actually there is no occupation uh, by Russia. There is Russian peacekeeper, uh, peacekeepers forces here in Artsakh in order to uh, protect our life and our security. We drive along a road that is effectively a new international border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We stop in a village and a group of Azerbaijani soldiers come out to greet us. Assalamu alaikum. Journalist, BBC. Yes, how are you? Fine, thanks. That's a Russian peacekeeper joining us. Are you allowed on the road here? This is an Armenian road, no? I don't know, on the map. No. <laughs> no? no. So whose road is this? Whose road is this? There's still plenty to be thrashed out on the ground, but what's clear is that the war and the deployment of peacekeepers has returned Russia to a pivotal role in the southern Caucasus. And, at the same time, delivered a message to leaders in the post-Soviet space who attempted to look west. Russian influence uh, had been increased uh, after this uh, peace um, a deal not only inside Azerbaijan and Armenia, but also in other countries as well. 
because of other countries now uh, has the lesson. If you have American puppet as your leader of your country, you will lose your territory. The so-called American puppet is Nikol Pashinyan, Armenia's prime minister. He came to power in a popular uprising three years ago and has shouldered much of the blame for the loss of Karabakh. So Mets, Mets, Anhajogutun, eh, Mesamar, so Mets Aretena, Mets. There have been several months of demonstrations in Yerevan against Mr. Pashinyan. Critics say he should have maintained better relations with Moscow and, given Azerbaijan's alliance with Turkey, made concessions to avoid war. Despite all of these facts, Nikol Pashinyan chose, chose to reject the peace proposals that were negotiated. So, that was a huge diplomatic failure that actually brought a catastrophe to Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Russia, not Armenia, is now Nagorno-Karabakh's key relationship. Moscow will ultimately have to decide if it wants a long-term military presence that protects the Armenian enclave. If not, Azerbaijan will surely get its way and be allowed to take control. The Lalayen's concerns are more short term. They're waiting in Yerevan for news of Eric. Good luck. Yeah, I wish you good luck. Especially, I hope you find your brother. And could we toast to Armenians and Azerbaijanis living side by side, or is that too much? It's an idea which almost everyone we've spoken to for this film thinks is unrealistic right now. <laughs> Georgi's mum is listening from the corner. <laughs> Two wars, two very different outcomes. For Azerbaijan, the struggle for Karabakh is over. For Armenians, it's very much alive.